does that happen? Our chimney was tiny. Some people don't have chimneys. The wonder of it all. That he lives at the North Pole. Nobody lives at the North Pole. No one would want to live at the North Pole. The wonder of it. Isn't that incredible? And, and that's the joy and the perspective I have now as a grandfatherly type age person. I'm not a grandfather yet. I'm a, a grand dog father, but a grandfather dog, I don't know, we, whatever. <laughs> At this age, you look at all oh, the joy of Christmas and, and just all of that and awe-inspiring wonder. And how does that happen? And the questions, and you're watching children think through those things about the guy that lives at the North Pole off-grid. What's interesting is, is that somehow... There's something special about not being able to reconcile all of that as a child and the wonder and the joy of that as a child. And I, I sometimes wonder, and, and we talk about wistfully about having lost that wonder and that faithfulness and that the joy of the mystery of Christmas. And part of that Part of the perspective as an old man now, watching children have that wide-eyed wonder, asking those questions of, of how do reindeer fly, and, and how does he know whether I've been a good boy or not? Children are trained in wonder and mystery. Not just at Christmas, but and we, we, we talk about the fact that, oh, wouldn't it be nice to go back to that point, that place where you have this awe and wonder and questioning and this experience of, I just have no idea, and, but knowing that it happens or thinking it happens. It's as you age that the veil of reality is taken back. And the effects of the modern cultural history begin to wane, and some of the awe and the wonder comes out of Christmas. As I look in perspective these days, and I see the cultural Christmas, and I see the biblical truth of Christmas, and the, the wonder and the inspiring secular myths that we have. I sometimes shake my head and go, do we not understand that the, the awe and the wonder that is in our cultural and secular story is far exceeded in its ability by biblical truth to create awe and wonder. You understand that I'm saying, you think that flying reindeer are a big deal. When we look at the biblical story, there is much more opportunity for, how did that happen? Why did he do it that way? And you and I, regardless of how old we are, have the ability to move back into that ageless wonder, that awe-inspiring See, that's the beauty of Christmas, if you're willing to take the journey. If you're willing to step and, and set aside the cultural myths, but embrace the biblical truth of M Messiah coming. That truth and fact are stranger than fiction. See, that's the biblical narrative. That's what the story of Christmas is about. It is stranger. Hey, the truth is stranger than the fiction. And the, the secular world has attempted to match the grandeur, grandeur, the wonder, the power of the nativity story, of how all of that came about. 
and the myth has been found lacking, it cannot compare. See, because there's a number of facts that you and I need to look at because they, this story is one of strangeness, weirdness, if you will, shock, that you still sit back and go, how did that happen? See, I... I'd like us to review the perspective of the story. Now, I'm going to do something I rarely ever do. I, I'm not going to be speaking expositionally, in a sense, in that we're looking at one passage, but we're going to look at a number of places. You know the, the narrative. You know the story. You know the, the timeline. But as we look at this, I want you to look at the peculiarity, the wonder-inspiring parts of this story. It begins in Matthew chapter 1, verse 17. And I call it the wonder of the timing of Christmas. See, as I've been reading over this and been looking at this, and as I've gained perspective, I've, I've sat and gone, you know what? There's something really, I mean, wonder, awe-inspiring. How did he do that? Well, we know how he did it, but not really. That he had it in his mind that he, that it is that way. It says, thus there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David. 14 from David to the exile, to the exile to Babylon. And 14 from the exile to the Messiah. You see a pattern? Timing all important. 14 generations, exile. 14 generations uh, to, to David, 14 generations to the exile. 14 generations from the exile to the Messiah. They say, well, that's not that big a deal. Said, but isn't it interesting and awe-inspiring? And how did he do that? Timing is always amazing in the Christmas story, in the narrative. There's a second thing, and it, it, it's what really causes most people to stand or fall on the truth of Jesus, and that is the virgin birth. Through the Holy Spirit, God came upon Mary, and, and the virgin birth is one of those, wow, how did that happen? Did that really happen? How does he do that? And the wonder and the awe and the, huh. See, that's what brings this whole story into focus, is that what couldn't be is. What never was has now become. What needed to happen did occur. The virgin birth. That God persuaded Joseph to go through with what happened. It makes you wonder. We find it in Luke chapter 1, verse 35. He says, the angel answered. Uh, pick it up at 34. How will this be, Mary asked the, answer, asked the angel, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Why did God do it that way? Awe-inspiring wonder. There's a third one. And I, I can't name all of them because there is so much in this narrative, but I'm just going to name a few of them. That he was born in Bethlehem. Now this is another one of those timing things. This is another one of those place and location things. That how did God make that happen? He was born in Bethlehem. Lived up north. Somehow he came to the south, where it's better living. Luke 2.1 says, let me get there if I can. Keep missing it. Luke 2.1 says, in those days Caesar Augustus 
issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. How did Jesus fulfill the Messiah prophecy? Not by plans of Joseph. He didn't create it. Mary didn't figure it out. Nobody planned it except in the heart and the mind of God. And he moved upon Caesar Augustus to make that happen. Wow. Now, if that does not inspire wonder in you, to move people 90 miles in those days, long walk. Well, even today, long, maybe even longer walk. To move you that far so that a prof- prophecy that you never imagined could happen now becomes true. If that doesn't inspire wonder, I don't know what will. I mean, that's better than flying reindeer, isn't it? There's a fourth one, and this is probably one of my favorite wonders. And that is the wonder of the moving star. I still, I still lay awake at night and go, how did that happen? What, did, what was going on there? Matthew chapter 2, verse 9. And he says, and it says, and they had heard the king, and when they had heard, after they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. We got moving stars. We have stars that give directions. They didn't need Google. It was a God made Google. See, think about that. Have you ever seen a star move over some location and you go, yep, that's where it's at? Maybe it happens, but I don't know. Now that, that is better than elves making toys that arrive through a chimney. You get the picture. This is, this is how did that happen? In fact, one of the great miracles that women, uh, one of the great wonders that women have is that men would stop and ask directions. The wise men stopped, asked the king. See, that's that's awe-inspiring wonder. Awe-inspiring wonder that that men hundreds of miles away would look in the sky and go, oh, a king is born. See, we can't do that. We don't have that technology today. See, how did they do that? And And they wait and they come at just the right time. See, if that does not inspire, oh, then you must be... There's something wrong with your wonder meter. (laughs) See, see the the Messiah, isn't it it make you wonder that the, the Messiah, the king, was born, but the Jewish king didn't even know the prophecy of where it would be born. See, now that, you go, how did, but guys, that far away came, and they knew the king was born. They knew that the Messiah had come. They knew that something big had occurred, and so big that they would travel day and night for weeks so that they could experience the Messiah. See, now that's, that's, that's big stuff. There's a fifth one. And it's also... I say, oh, I have a lot of favorites, but it's, it's one of my, my, my top five favorites, but really, it's found in Luke chapter 2, verse 9. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, talking about the shepherds, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. For today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. That the lowest group in society were the first ones to know about the Messiah. The nobodies, the has-beens, the dirty ones... 
the crooked ones, the ones that were questionable, the shepherds, were the first to know about the good shepherd. See, that's, that's one of those, hmm, that's a thinker. Why wouldn't he have shown up to, in the temple in Jerusalem? Why didn't they tell, why did he do it that way? What happened here? Why would he announce to, see, these are the questions that cause wonder. That cause you to lay awake on Christmas Eve, and instead of listening for hooves on the roof, you are listening for the announcement of Messiah. See, the, the Christmas and the coming of a long awaited Messiah, the Atoner, the Emmanuel, God with us. See, that is the true wonder of Christmas. And I'm going to invite you this season. Hey, I don't know where you're at in your journey. You probably are not old like me and don't have the perspective, but there's nothing wrong with having the, the cultural story and the wonder of that and thinking about that, but if you want to really wonder, stand in awe, Walk into faithful acceptance. Then the Christmas story this season really begs to question, question, how did he do that? I invite you this, this season to come and lay aside everything you think you know and begin to walk into faithful wonder of Messiah come. And how did he do that? And walk into the joy that you do not have to know all of the ways it was done to enjoy the fact that God is among us. That God has come. That the atoner has arrived. That the seeker has found us. Would you join me this Christmas season with a new a renewed spirit of wonder, and go, wow. I don't know how he did it, but he did. I'm still not sure why he did it, but he did. And you and I would come and worship just as those shepherds, in awe and joy, in wonder. Let's pray. Father, Would you remind us of your incredible goodness that you've given us this narrative, that you've given us not a myth, but you've placed facts. You've placed your truth in your word that we might be in awe of you and your action among us, that your timing is perfect, that you could even cause men to stop and ask directions that you would come to the lowest in society and proclaim yourself. Would you cause us to have that same kind of wonder and awe as we did when we were waiting for a man in a red suit? For you come and bring us the greatest gift, yourself. Thank you for coming among us. Thank you for remaining among us. Thank you for living in us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.